video number two. Um, I took your feedback and tried to get better lighting this time around. So you will hopefully get to see a lot more of the steps in detail. So today's video is on how to mask dark circles on your face and actually just dark spots on your face in general. This is something that I have really struggled with my whole life. And I think it's common for um, definitely Indian women, ethnic women, but I have several friends who are Caucasian who struggle with this as well. Um, so I've learned a few tricks from makeup artists and just like with my profession over the years. And so I wanted to share with you some cool little tricks to mask them and hopefully you guys learn something. So to start off, you need to find the dark spot corrector that works best for you. So one thing to note is that they actually do have dark spot correctors that already exist in the market from like brands like Makeup Artist Pro brands. So one from Mud I've used in the past and I actually have one here from Tem2 um, that's called the Neutralizer Wheel. And so this is kind of like something that's really makeup artist friendly. They have every shade depending on whose skin they're that they're working on. Um, but honestly, like I created like a DIY version of this. Like why go and spend money on something that you can actually use from like the products you already have at home. So if you have a, if you're a similar skin tone to me and have dark spot um, circles under your eyes, I recommend using a really bright orange red lipstick for um, your skin tone because that really will just like even out the dark circles and neutralize your face. So today I have one from MAC. Um, this is like one of the limited edition ones, Marilyn Monroe collection, but honestly like just use whatever red orangey lipstick you have. I've used one um, from NARS before. It doesn't really matter. Um, I used plenty. So what you do is is you take this and take a makeup brush. This is one that I have from Birchbox and you just kind of dab it in there like so. I don't know if you guys can see this. Okay. And then just like put it under your eyes or honestly like I think I have used this on places like you can see I have blemishes like on top of my face but if you have discoloration on your chin or anywhere else it can go anywhere. The neutralization that this does under your eyes before you put on a concealer is crazy. So I put it a little heavier than like a lot of makeup artists I've seen do on me. Um, but you know what? Like I just think that it's works for me and I just like to play with it. Um, no need to take any more than this. This is definitely a lot more than you really need to do, but um, just kind of rub it in there like so. Okay, so once your face looks this insane, the next step is to go about your makeup routine as you normally would. So actually, you know what, just to show you guys like the effect that it can do on your face, the other place you have dark spots. So here I have like a dark spot right there. You can see, I'm just gonna put it right there just to show you that this is not just for dark spots underneath your eyes. It's just dark spot corrector for anywhere. Oh, and I have this like birthmark on my nose that I can like kind of cover up too. <laughs> okay. Um, then I'm gonna take my concealer. Today I'm using this one from MAC. I love MAC concealers. It just like really does high coverage underneath my under eye circles. Um, I use shade NC42 for my skin tone. I'm telling you like the difference between doing this versus just normally putting your concealer. I mean, I've heard from so many girls that even with concealer, you can still see through and see the dark circles under your eyes. And I have really dark circles and I feel like this masks it pretty well. So now you just go about your normal makeup routine.
So if there's one takeaway I want you guys to get from this video is that you do not need to go buy additional products to mask dark under eye circles or dark spots on your face. You can use products you already have the comfort of your own home. I'm sure you have a red lipstick and if you have a similar skin tone to me, play with it. Put it on on the places that you feel like you have dark spots on your face and go about your normal makeup routine and you might really surprise yourself and really like how it makes your whole face look. So um, as I asked last time, please leave your thoughts below, negative, positive. I want to hear your feedback. And if you have any ideas for future videos, let me know and I will see you next time. Bye. Welcome everyone to I Am Remarkable Week 2022. I am so excited to be here with you. I Am Remarkable is a global movement that empowers everyone with a focus on women and underrepresented groups to celebrate their achievements in the workplace and beyond. To date, 400,000 people have attended the workshop across 170 countries and over a thousand companies. And this year we are celebrating our third global I Am Remarkable Week, which is the highlight event of our year where we celebrate all things remarkable. The week is running from the 28th to the 30th of September, and you can join all our sessions through our website. To give you an overview of how today's session will flow, we're gonna start off hearing from the amazing Deepika, who you just saw, on what makes her remarkable, her views on YouTube, the beauty industry, how she's building community, and hopefully we'll all learn something about her that she's never shared before. We'll then have some time for some live Q&A at the end. So we're hoping you're gonna type some questions into the Q&A box and we'll be able to do uh, as best as we can to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, my name is Sapna Chadha. I am the VP of Marketing for India and Southeast Asia for Google based in Singapore. Um, so we have multiple time zones um, here with us today. Um, and I am really passionate about gender equality and eradicating gender divides on the internet um, and making the world uh, more inclusive. I'm also a South Asian woman um, who's worked in different parts of the world, which is why I'm so excited to speak today um, to Deepika. Let me introduce Deepika Muthiala now. She's a South Asian beauty entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman. She's a founder and she's the CEO of Live Tinted, a multicultural community that's focused on beauty and culture. After her YouTube video that you just watched went viral in 2015, Deepika launched Live Tinted in 2018 as an inclusive digital community that explores diverse beauty for every shade in between. Live Tinted focuses on underrepresented groups in beauty and their personal journeys with culture and identity. Uh, welcome Deepika, I'm so excited for you to be here with us. Thank you so much for having me. Watching that video was definitely a blast from the past. <laughs> oh, well, I must say, I think a lot of people have been watching it this week um, and they're so excited to hear from you. I personally um, tried the uh, tried the red lipstick yesterday and it does work. I can't believe I didn't know about this for, for so long, but let's start the conversation by asking the question we ask all of our speakers at I Am Remarkable Week. Deepika, what makes you remarkable? I think what makes me remarkable is the fact that I'm fearless and I, I went for it and I still go for it. Um, I'm proud of that. I had no connections, no ends to anything and, and I just went for it. So I think that makes me pretty remarkable. That is that is pretty remarkable. We, we talk a lot about confidence and, and, and guts and you have a ton. So let's talk about your story. Your journey in the public eye started in 2015 when your YouTube video showing viewers how to neutralize hyperpigmentation with a lipstick um, really took off. Um, take us back to in time a bit. Tell us how you got to that point. And was being an influencer really what you dreamt of doing? Um, I, would, I would love to understand like what actually happened because there's always a backstory. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody dreamt i think these days there's kids who grow up dreaming of being an influencer but uh it wasn't even a career path then so it, it definitely was not like a calculated planned move but at that time i was working at a beauty startup and my dream and goal was always to create my own beauty brand 
And as I was at this beauty startup, I realized that um, there was this whole world of influencers growing and emerging in the world. And they were, they were taking over the new wave of marketing. And so as a beauty marketer myself at that time, I recognized that this was something that the company needed to at least get behind. And as they did that, I started working on our influencer programs. And that's when I realized there was nobody who looked like me doing this. And so I saw this disconnect of this industry worth billions of dollars, a population of billions of humans, us, um, South Asian people that um, didn't have representation in this space. So I definitely saw an opportunity, but by no means, nobody plans that their second video that they ever post um, goes viral and it has like what 11 million views it changed my life and you you've talked about wanting to be a ceo um actually from the outset um and i i um i was thinking you know we have one thing in common which is that we both have indian parents yeah um, and uh i'd love to hear like how did your upbringing and your culture like affect your ambition and this idea of wanting to be a ceo yeah, I think we have a lot in common, honestly, like everything you were saying, I'm so inspired to hear your path. And by the way, it's incredible what you're doing and what you're running. And I know we talked, we had a little brief combo before this, and it was like, I hope you know your parents are proud of you. And and it's funny because I feel the same way that so many South Asian people and South Asian women feel, which is this constant desire and need to make your parents proud of you. Um, because you know how much sacrifice that they made to get to where they are to then help you get to achieve your dreams. But I think the disconnect and the hard part is that sometimes their definition of the American dream or the dream um, is, isn't the same as yours. And it, there is this disconnect of, well, how do I make them proud while also living my truth? And so I, at a very young age, I was 16 years old growing up in Texas, telling my family that I wanted to create my own beauty brand and I wanted to run it and I was gonna be a businesswoman. And so I could kind of merge my passions for this industry, but also be a businesswoman. And so I think that was also the tricky part for me when I fell into this whole YouTube influencer world, because I didn't know how to tell my parents that. And I also didn't know how to get respect for doing that versus if I was a CEO of a company, there was respect and credibility behind that. Um, but it was really hard because I had no, I had no um, role models to look up to. Hmm. That's um, that's interesting. Well, you're a role model, and I'm sure your parents are super proud of you too. We have to keep telling each other. Um, you are too, by the way. I, I, when we first talked yesterday, I was like, "Wow, what an amazing, huge, remarkable woman that I get to speak with." Um, yeah. yeah, I do think sometimes we just need to get that reminder, though. Yeah, that's what this week is all about. Um, so, talk to us now about YouTube. It's the platform that has played a role in your journey, as you just said. Um, so many views of your video, but it's helped to um, can still as a part of your your daily life amongst other channels. How did um, like what are your thoughts on like beauty influencers, how they're using the platform? How are you using the platform still today for tips and tricks? And and like it's been an evolution for the last um, you know seven years, I guess you can say. Love to hear your thoughts on YouTube. Evolution is the perfect word to describe how I feel about it. Um, I'm so grateful because that video that everyone just watched, um, it, it did change my life. Uh, but I have to give myself credit and recognize that I made the initiative to make that video. And when that video did go viral, I made the leap of faith to quit my job and go for this whole career of being a beauty influencer, which was a wild west. I had, again, no guidance, no connections. I didn't really know what I was doing. But I did know that there was an opportunity in front of me. And and like I said a second ago, I I was fearless. I kind of just felt like I was in my 20s. I had no one else depending on me. And I it just felt like there was no other option but just to go for it. It almost felt like the bigger risk was not going for it, if that makes any sense, that there was going to be no other time in my life that I had no other um, responsibilities besides myself. And so I, I took the leap of faith and I went for it. And, you know, my career ended up being making YouTube videos while simultaneously doing um, segments on TV, because, again, I felt like if my parents could have bragging rights and say that I was on 
um, a national TV show that aired every morning in America that they would have bragging rights, but to tell their friends that their daughter was a YouTuber, granted <laughs> many YouTubers um, are creating a career for themselves, making more money than I think anyone ever could have imagined. And so I think it's very interesting because for me, I had some shame around being called a YouTuber or an influencer, but I've gotten over it. Now, when somebody says it to me, I, I have no, I feel no way about it because it is the new way of marketing. And there are YouTubers out there that are making an incredible living for themselves, millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars, whatever path you're on, there is a whole new world out there of marketing that you can either be resistant of or you can educate yourself and get behind it. Um, either way, it's it's shifting and happening and evolving. Like you said, it's been an evolution. I think for me personally, I've kind of shifted from doing beauty tutorials to more vlog style, sharing my personal journey of building my company because that kind of feels like my truth. And I guess I, I always constantly ask myself, none of this is worth it unless you are being yourself, being authentic, living your truth and having joy along the way. And I found myself not enjoying doing the beauty tutorials anymore. It just like wasn't who I really was. I wanted to be a businesswoman. I wanted to run this company. And so I kind of pivoted. Um, but, you know, for years I did do that. And I kind of had to feel like there was a point where I just recognized that I found more joy helping other people become influencers and being more the business side of it. That was kind of my realization of like, Deepika, you've done your time. You've been the token brown girl in every brand campaign, everything like name the beauty brand. And I was in that, I did an ad for them. And so it was a really great thing for me, but I felt in my soul and in my bones that it was my purpose to sort of pave and open doors. So there wasn't just one of us and there wasn't that scarcity mentality and that we could show that we all could win. And it's just really beautiful to see how many beauty influencers there are that are brown girls, but also just women of color and the diversity that exists now. And it's, it's, it's awesome to see the evolution. It's absolutely awesome. I love how you talk about your business and your founder, you're a CEO. Um, and it's so rare like to see women CEOs and founders in the first place. And, and you mentioned token brown girl or being, you know, nobody looked like you. Um, and I think that's so amazing that with all of the barriers that you've had, you've pushed forward um, in this multicultural world to really show that anything's possible. I really love how you're, you talk about wanting Live Tinted to be a multicultural community and how beauty can bring people and conversation together. Like, tell us a bit about your community, um, where it is, where is it going? Yeah, by the way, can y'all hear me okay? There's like a little bit of an echo, but I, I just want to make sure. Oh, you yeah. There was a little bit of a noise, but I can hear you totally fine. Oh, good. Okay. okay, just wanted to check. Um, so my community, I think after being um, a beauty influencer, but before that I was working at a beauty startup, and before that I was working at the biggest beauty brand in the world. And so I've seen it from every lens. So when I did start my own brand, what I recognized was there was an opportunity to create a community around a collective of humans who haven't seen themselves represented in the beauty industry. And so it was really important to me that instead of just creating this brand and calling it Deep Beauty, um, we did start it as a name that could kind of connect people from all different backgrounds and starting it as a community platform. So what that really meant for me was it simply started as an Instagram page back in 2018, January, where I, every day would showcase a different face that I felt like wasn't traditionally shown in the beauty industry. And we talked about taboo subjects like colorism, facial hair, the big noses, big noses, quote unquote, because it's like, what is big anyways? And um, I just wanted to open up conversations that I hadn't seen talked about on beauty outlets. And I had so much joy and happiness and kind of building out that community. And once it got to a certain size, I recognized that what we had had hypothesized about this idea of every shade in between, there really were a lot of people who felt like they were in between the beauty narrative. And so what I thought would be a brown community ended up being this beautiful community of people from all different backgrounds who feel like they didn't see themselves. 
it was predominantly South Asian women because there literally was not any brand out there that was founded by someone who looked like us. But it was just so beautiful to see people from different backgrounds being like, I'm tinted too. And then I realized this word tinted is something that can connect people because we all have a tint to our skin, no matter where on the spectrum you lie. And that was really beautiful to me and something that I got really excited about, that this brand could be so much bigger than I had even imagined it could be. Um, and the, the, the stories and that you have pro probably have and from the connections in your community, I can only imagine. Would you mind like sharing an inspirational story of some connection through the community that you've experienced? Oh my gosh, yes. I have so many. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, like since the beginning, what's kept me going and anyone who's an entrepreneur that's listening can totally relate to this, I'm sure. It is the hardest journey I've ever been experienced in my life and and i just don't think people and again on social media no one's really showing the hard side so that's another reason on my youtube channel i like to show that um but what's always kept me going is i get daily dms from people all around the world saying thank you please keep going um because of you i went to go be a ballerina or i went to go be an artist and i went to go do this because i thought i had to stick in this traditional career path because that's what i was told by my family but seeing somebody who looks like me do this makes me feel like I can too. So that in itself is inspiring, right? Like on a day-to-day -day basis, everything from day one of launching on January, 2018 to yesterday, September 28th, 2021, um, wait, 2020, we're in 2022. Gosh, I don't need, I can't keep up. We're in 2022. Um, just yesterday, we did a community Zoom where we brought together some people who are in the community. I like to do those every once in a while. And um, they shared a story with me. She was like shaking and she just was like, I've been dreaming of the day that I can sit here and tell you this, that my whole life, I never felt like enough. I hid in under an umbrella, avoided the sun because I was told that if I got any darker, I wouldn't be considered beautiful. And seeing you live your truth and seeing you in these brand campaigns and seeing you build out this community where I see that I'm not alone makes me feel like I'm enough. And that to me is like what this is all about. Honestly, like we're doing it through selling beauty products, but it's really the message and the vehicle behind it that makes me feel like, I don't know, it's, it, it stands for something deeper. And that to me um, means a lot and something I um, don't take lightly. For sure. Wow. Oh, I don't know how you don't lose um, your, I was getting a little emotional even just listening to that. Um, and it's amazing. Do you relate to that? Do you relate to that? <laughs> Like I do. I mean, I my whole life, I I heard the same thing. I think you know, around not getting in the sun, and and you wondered, right? I I, I lived part of my life in in the U.S., right, and never felt like I belong there. Actually, coming back to Asia, I always feel like I, I see more people that look like me. Um, but I always wonder why I had to worry about it when I was in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and I shouldn't have. And now, like you're you're celebrating diversity and underrepresented groups and kind of living the tenets of uh, this idea of I am remarkable every day um, and bringing it to workplaces and bringing it to your company. And it's it's amazing to see how you're really showing the world that all hues are beautiful. Um, and I'd love to go back to like where to where this maybe, you know, you talked about your your start at big beauty brands. Um, you, you mentioned you worked at L'Oreal um, and Victoria's Secret in your early career. Um, and saw the colorism problem that many of us have experienced. Um, what would you tell your audience today um, on how they can help their own companies? A lot of people listening today are, are advocates of diversity, equity, and inclusion, might be leading teams, thinking about how to elevate their brand and their culture by embracing inclusivity and diversity in an authentic way. What would you tell, what would you tell them? I would say, first of all, I recognize that it's it's a big, heavy thing to tackle, but it's an important and a responsibility that we all have to push that forward um, in companies. And the thing is that it cannot be um, done in just one part of the company. So I'll give you an example. A lot of brands in the beauty industry specifically, but even outside of it, are doing a lot of campaigns and marketing efforts showcasing in their marketing efforts diversity. They'll have people from different backgrounds 
But it, something I always notice, like I mentioned earlier, is the tokenization of it. They'll have their like token black girl, token brown girl, token every race. And that's kind of, and they feel like we did it. Um, and then there's some that are doing better and not just tokenizing it and having multiple within their marketing efforts again. So that's very forward facing and something that I feel like is good. It's great. And I think it is important. I think the thing that needs to exist and is so, so critical for not even just because, you know, I think a lot of companies, if we're all being honest, are doing it in a performative way that they feel like they must because of the state of the world and everything that's happened since 2020. But I think that part of me doesn't look at that as a let's not be so negative on it because progress is progress. And you think about the next generation of people growing up, they won't see it as performative. They're just going to grow up in a world where it exists. So we got to do the little actions every single day to make sure it happens. But if you're in a position in a company that can push for internal diversity and inclusion and equity, you need to be remarkable and use your voice and help push that forward because um, it starts from the inside out. That's the most important thing. And I'm recognizing it with my own company. We have such a diverse team. Um, we actually, and this was not structured in any way, but I think it's just because the people who resonate with the brand are people of color. So they've been coming and applying for jobs in volume. And I just find it so beautiful to have the diversity of opinions and thoughts. It, 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 it builds better teams, it builds better companies, and it, 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 sh it shines through. And then that need for performative action goes away because you have it from the inside out. So I think, you know, staying away from performative action, get the right people in the room, the diverse voices in the room, so you can make that action happen on the inside and then showcase it on the outside. Did you feel like you had that in your career, um, like the diversity of, that you're experiencing today up until now? No, not at all. <laughs> Zero. No, um, no, I didn't. But again, like I said, like even when I was the token brown girl in Name the Beauty Matte campaign, a L'Oreal commercial, like I did all of these things. And it was to me, instead of focusing on being annoyed that I was the only one, all I kept thinking was, when I grew up, when you grew up, there was no brown girl in the campaigns. So that's progress. And we've got to make steps and efforts and recognize that the progress is happening and focus on the positivity there. Um, and so that that's what I choose to focus on because we've come a long way. There's still a long way to go. But how beautiful is it to say that I was in a L'Oreal commercial and a Samsung commercial that these air during the, soup, uh, the Golden Globes or things like that. Like, how cool is it that there's a little girl growing up that sees that on TV and says, that girl looks like me. So that's a it big is, win. It's so, so, so cool. You have such a half glass full attitude towards so much. Like and when we talk about the goings getting tough or diversity isn't what we want it to be or how to push forward. It's so, um, it's so um, amazing and it's rare. Um, you know, one of the things that we do in the I Am Remarkable workshops is participants are invited to challenge the social perception around confidence and self-promotion and to really celebrate um, wins and celebrate success. Can you talk to us about how easy you find it to celebrate your own success? Is this something that comes easy to you or have you had to get over something to get here? It's so hard. Or maybe you're, maybe you're still on the journey too. That could also be it. I'm absolutely still on the journey. I struggle with it all the time. I remember we just won the Allure Best of Beauty Award three years in a row, which makes us in the Hall of Fame, which like only the most iconic beauty brands are in that. And I remember somebody congratulated me in person and I was like, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's great. We just, we really need to see the sales match up to it. So, you know, I don't want to sit here and I, I I do try to look at everything half glass full versus empty. That said, on the flip side of it, I feel this like personal pressure and um, duty to the world to continue to build this brand because the bigger of a brand we are, the more impact we can make in the world and in this industry. And so it's really hard for me to slow down and celebrate the wins. Um, you know, the, one of the coolest things that happened to me because it gave me bragging rights to my dad was I was named Time Magazine's um, Next Generation Leader um, last year, or this year, gosh, it was this year. We're in 2022, um, <laughs> and and so cool, for sure. But I, 
I just kept going because I was like, great, these accolades are awesome and stuff, but there's so much work to be done. This community needs me, so I have to keep going. And I want to live up to this leader responsibility. And so it's really, really hard, especially when you're building a business and there's a million hats that you wear to slow down and say, I'm proud of myself. I actually named our newest gloss proud as a daily reminder that I hope whenever we pull it out, that anyone pulls it out, they take a second to be proud of themselves because I feel proud of everything I've built. But even just saying little words and affirmations, and you'll see a lot of our products are named just really beautiful words like intent, legacy, just words that I want to like on a day to day basis think about. Balance is one of our shades um, because we need those reminders sometimes. Wow. I must say, as a marketer, like your naming of everything from your, your company name to this is, um, it's so spot on. It's so, it tells a story in just one word, uh, tinted. I, I loved your explanation of that. But you've been successful in, in many areas, but we all know what it's like to fail at something also. Um, share what like ex experience that you've had, personal, professional. How do you cope with failure? Well, I've had to shape the word failure and shift it even when I say it out loud to like saying it's lessons learned because failure just feels like such a negative word. And if you say you're failing, because oh, I failed a lot, <laughs> I still <laughs> fail. But if you shape it as lessons learned, it's actually like, yeah, I, I had another lesson learned today. So that's nice. That's good. I've learned from this and I'll do better the next time. And then it just kind of really puts life and things into perspective because again, sometimes everything in our own lives feels so big. Um, and then when you really just like take a step back and focus on the gratitude of like, how blessed am I that I'm building my dream company? And like, I might've failed. Um, I've experienced that a lot. I'm going through fundraising. I mentioned this to you. Um, it's like the hardest thing I've done in my life. And I, I don't want to look at it as failures because like, I'm, this is my first time being a CEO. This is my first time building a company. Um, I'm going to have a lot of lessons learned, not failures ahead of me, and they're going to keep happening. So, um, yeah, lots of lessons learned daily. <laughs> yeah, no, and and we get better with each of them. It's, it's lessons that, that I'm sure you're in like indirectly or directly applying to the next challenge that you have. Okay, on to a less serious question and, and getting off of any kind of negative words. We don't want that on the call today. Your okay. personal favorite pick me up that sets you straight. Is it is it makeup? Is it food? Is it is what is it? My niece and nephew. Oh. They um, both were born during the pandemic. I moved home to Texas for two years and had two years of like grounding and like I could be so stressed out. And I used to say the ocean and nature would calm me and, and make me zen, but like nothing compares to the joy and the innocence and the simplicity of a, of a kid, a baby who just like, you know, they, they just remind you that joy and happiness is before you become in this jaded world of all the things and just being around them is, is the best. How old are they? Two and like six months. <laughs> oh, that's why <laughs> they're yeah. so far from that world that we have. Um, oh, that's uh, I sometimes, love that. we need that. sometimes we need people who didn't, you know, when they ask questions, it's like almost the most simple questions, and it's like, good point, good point, Jaden. Oh, you know? yes, yeah, I have twins, they're now 10, um, a boy and a girl, and I know exactly what you mean, but now it's like they're getting older and it's getting slightly into the more the real world. Oh um, man, do they have phones yet? <laughs> Yeah, I gave in. I told myself I wouldn't, but I, I just gave in. And totally. Yeah, you have to. I, anyways, that's a different discussion. Yeah. I, tr oh I tried. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so speaking of um, like life, you just started a new chapter in your life. You moved back to California. Um, what's next for you? And what's next for Live Tinted? So. As a business owner, you obviously have to do planning and forecasting and strategy sessions for the next year, two years, five years. Um, but I feel like if there's anything we've learned the last two years is that life is so freaking short. And there are so many great things, lessons and wins and things happening on a day-to-day -day basis that 
if I get so caught up in the what is the end game for Live Tinted, I'm going to take away from the joy of what's happening right now. And it's a daily practice. I'm saying this to you many times in this conversation because I think everyone needs to be reminded many times that we need to just find the joy in day-to-day -day life. And so I'm so happy to be back in LA with the team. Like I was just in the office earlier today and it's so efficient and quick and the energy of them gets, fuels me. And I think it's like a mutual thing both ways. Um, but there's so many exciting things happening. We had a partnership just launched. We're already working on the next partnership. There's like a couple of them happening in the next few weeks. If I get so caught up in the, the sales, which again is really hard because I'm the founder, but I'm also the CEO. So there is like a, you know, a, a duty I have to make sure that we're financially at a great place. Um, but I, I have to balance the two because what is the point otherwise? What is the point? You seem to have such an amazing team from what I've experienced thus far. Um, and you guys seem like you have a ton of fun together. So I'm sure being back in real life um, has changed a lot for for all for the company. Um, I, I I know that it like what it's like to be with your team now. I know there's a lot of debates on should we be in person or not. I know. Uh, but yeah, but it, I actually I saw one of the videos of your team doing a bit of a dance to yeah. the Kala Chashma trend song that and I I packed up. So um, let's um, now let's move um, into. Q and A um, from the audience. Um, we're getting ready. Please do put in your questions um, so we can have Deepika address questions on your mind. I think we have our first question that's come in. It is from Sandhya. Hi, Deepika. Firstly, thank you for representing the community so well. Secondly, I'm expecting a baby girl later this year. If you could tell her one thing to empower her based on your personal experience, what would that be? Wow. Be unapologetically yourself. And the key word there is unapologetically because um, my biggest regret growing up was that I was so embarrassed of my parents. I was so embarrassed of my family. I was so embarrassed of my culture. And I just want every little girl out there to know that like the things that are unique about you are the things that will make you stand out and win and succeed and just enjoy life more. Like all the things I used to be embarrassed about, my thick brows and um, my big South Indian eyes, it's just all these things. Now they're my favorite features about myself. I used to dye my hair blonde. I love my jet black hair now. And I just want, you know, your little girl to grow up, just know that like, what makes you different, that makes you you, is really dope. Um, and I hope everyone growing up today remembers that. I'm going to tell my daughter that. I um, I have to ask as a follow-up to that, like what changed? You, you mentioned at one point you were dyeing your hair and you were using blue lenses. Like what was the trigger? What, what happened? That made me kind of embrace who I am. Yeah, to make you unapologetic, just like you said. Well, I, to be honest, I think it's very recent years that I finally have gotten this confidence. Um, and it's come through my own success in my career that I've built that confidence, which is why I just, it's sad to say that I would say like at 30 years of life, I feel the most confident I, I, I ever have. But like, it sucks that you can't be 16 and feel that way. And granted, like, that's a part of life and the journey of life. And I think we go through those journeys till the end of life. But I think the parts that shouldn't exist is the idea of like where you come from, your skin tone, that should be celebrated. You know, there's always gonna be insecurities throughout life, but the skin tone piece of it makes it so sad to me. And what I hope we can change through the power of the beauty industry, at least my part and what I can do there, um, because it's just sad that it took me until this point of, I feel a certain level of confidence that I can now unapologetically be me and hopefully influence other people to do that. But it took that. Did you did you get affirmations from like what? Because I'm sure you were afraid to maybe make the shift at some point. Like, was there positive reinforcement? Um, no, I, I I feel like I this was a me myself and I and a self belief thing that happened. I love my mom to death, but she comes from an old school generation. Um, she was the one who told me to hide under an umbrella. I came home really dark one day. She cried, and so. It wasn't an upbringing I had. 
at all. And if anything, the, my surroundings and my environment only incur, like made me less confident. Um, so it, it was very much a lot of self work. I've been in therapy since I was 25 years old. I've been working on myself. Um, and so, yeah, I think again, it goes back to why I think I'm remarkable. It's like, I went for it, I did it and I did it for me and others, but like, I, I, I did it me, myself and I. Now I have a team and I love my team, like you said, but that initial drive was sort of in me and it feels like it was my purpose. Wow, that, um, that really resonates. I mean, going back, we, we, we talked about my experience also hearing my whole life about fair was better um, products that were that existed were actually told us the opposite. Um, and yeah. so many, so many, so many of us don't think to push back, right? And, and we just accept the norms. And so um, I find like a, you're, kind, you're, you're saying that even when everybody was against it, you still got the confidence, which is again, like we see confidence changes everything. And that actually um, comes, maybe connects to the question, next question we have from Shivangi, which is how do you start to love yourself? Um, and not get affected by what they think. How did you, like, it was me, myself, and I, and, but how did you not let what people think affect you? To be fair, it did for a very long time, especially in the social media world. Like, I would get so hurt. I never got hurt by people making comments about my, like, physical appearance and stuff like that, because the way I always thought about it was, like, I, I, I almost have sympathy and empathy for the people who say those things to me online because I always think about how much pain they must be going through themselves to be saying something negative about someone they've literally never met in their life. Like I, I always end up like, I, I feel like I'm an empath. So every time somebody says that, I feel this like pain in me. It's like, wow, that's really sad that you felt like you had to attack me today. You don't even know me. You don't know, you see this much of me on the internet. Um, that's really sad. So I think a piece of me is, it's that lens of, if, you, if, if you're talking about the online sphere, but then on the bigger picture, you know, this is gonna sound a little morbid, but I think the second I got into my thirties and I'm sure each decade of my life, it's gonna keep getting there, but you realize the, the mortality of your life and you start to recognize that when it's all said and done and you're like, I don't know, 85 years old, 90 years old sitting there, do you really want to look back and say that you spent so much of your life not experiencing happiness and joy because you cared what a stranger thought about you? Like, it just feels a little silly when you put it in that context. And I think just putting it into that perspective reminds me that right now I want to love my life. And it, it, this is, again, easier said than done. Do not, I do not want people to think that I wake up joyful and I got this, but it's almost like I have to remind myself these things because otherwise you'll just go nuts with all the chaos of entrepreneurship, you know? No, absolutely. I, um, I think that, that, re that really resonates and that balance, right? Like, and it's probably circular what you go through every day and you have to keep coming out of it. Um, I have um, another question here, um, which is from Sumana and it talks about the fear of speaking up. Um, so is it sometimes daunting to speak up for what you believe in? And you talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of um, when you have to go pitch for your company at the cost of like getting judged and stereotyped. How do you speak up for uh, for this? And how do you talk yourself into doing what you do? And how do you maintain the balance between all the different roles that you hold? Yeah, I'm um, all There's good a bunch of pieces in there. Yeah, there's a lot in there. I want to answer them. Um, um, so I think the first part of it is, is like, yeah, I mean, I, I still to this day hear more no, more no's than yeses, especially when it relates to my company and like pitching the idea of even this brand for redefining cool and what cool should be in the beauty industry. And God, there were so many times that I was like so sad. I cried when I would pitch and then they would tell me like no and all those things. Um, I think I have like a little bit of a pity party where I'll like sit there and literally cry in bed and then I'll wake up and just keep going because again, I just feel like this is what I was here to do. Um, and, and there are those people who encourage me. I do feel very fortunate that I feel like I have a whole squad of humans and a whole honestly race that is rooting for me, which happens to be a fourth of the world. <laughs> just 
thing for me. And so I think that helps. Um, but I mean, I hear no's all the time. I've heard no's from South Asian people, which is unfortunate and, and really felt crappy, honestly. But they're the same people now who are asking to invest and, and want to get a meeting with me. And so I almost have this delusional level of self-belief is, is the really only way to say it. Um, and then this whole idea of balance, you know, I think it's, I do believe you can have everything you want in life. I just don't know if you can have them all at once at the same time. Mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. Because I, I really don't have a personal life at all. Like I, my parents ask me all the time when I'm going to go on a date and, and it's like, I can't even think about that. It's, it's too hard. I'm going to start now, now that I have this amazing team in place. But I just think that it's this very false narrative to pretend like you can do everything as if there's a million hours in a day, like I have to prioritize my company and my family and then whatever friends I can. But quite honestly, those have kind of fallen to the back burner. And now it's like my company, my family and myself. Um, and then it's hard to do the other two things, but that's why I'm building the company to a certain size where I can just focus on what I need to be doing. And then hopefully I can bring back in a thing called a personal life. So. I don't think we should be so hard on ourselves and recognize that there's different priorities at different moments in your life and that's okay. I love that because I think there is a false um, belief that you can have it all at any given point in time. And I, working hard is absolutely critical, especially like, to be a founder, there's no option around working hard to move forward as well. And so I love that idea about staging things um, because, and, and to be realistic. Um, about that as well. I'm sure you're getting a lot of pressure. Um, again, coming back to the Indian parents, I can see it, but I can tell you I push back on mine as well. Um, and uh, it can happen later in life. That's what I realized. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I do believe it'll happen. You know, that's why I don't, I'm not like stressed about it. I, have, I haven't made any effort towards it. And that's exactly. okay. Like, I, you know what's so beautiful about that is like, I know who I am from the inside out because I've done so much self work. So I'm going to be that much better of a partner one day. And I feel yes. like if I had done it any earlier in my life, I wouldn't have been able to be the best version of me for whoever that person is. So I have, I have no like sadness towards it. I do want to start now at this point in my life, but like, it's not in like a way of like, Oh no, all my friends are married. Oh no, I'm Indian and I'm not married. Like I really don't feel that way at all. Yeah. That's another set of videos that I'm sure could go viral if you could. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, this question from Schumann, love your sharing and your energy. Have you ever had an experience when you were genuinely trying to use your voice to elevate others and increase representation, but your efforts got called out as performative instead? What did you do when that happened? Yeah, I see those comments here and there. Um, what I focus on is there is a whole collective of people who are saying positive things and rooting for me. And then you can see that one comment and it can throw off your entire day. So I've had to get to the point now where I'm like recognizing that it is that one comment. Um, literally, it, it, the scale of volume, it's like hundreds and hundreds of comments that are so sweet. And then there's a person who's like, I don't believe it. I don't believe what she's doing. She's just trying to make a quick buck. And that's where it goes back to just knowing yourself and who you are and doing that work on that. Because then what other people say about you just kind of feels like it just slides off your shoulders because you're like, all right, cool, bro. You don't know me. That's fine. I know what I'm doing and the people who support me know what I'm doing and that's enough for me. But it only has come through lots of self-work. I mean, that is, I treat therapy on a weekly basis the way I treat going to the, um, going into an office. Like it's a meeting on my calendar that my assistant knows I can't move. Um, in the beginning I had, I felt weird about it. It's like, oh, don't worry about it. Just move it and let's do this. But that work on yourself is so critical because then you just, everything else starts to fall into place and you just, everything else becomes noise. Wow. Okay. I'm adapting that one from this week. Um, uh, another question that we have is actually, can I ask a follow up when you do get the, um, the negative online comments, like how do you, or your team, how do you respond now? Or do you? Well, it did get to the point where, you know, because it, it, it really, really deteriorates your mental health. And I care so much about, like, again, that empath in me. So it got to the point where, again, I had to outsource it. Like, I got to the point where I try not to look at the comments. I still do because it's hard to not. And I like responding to the sweet comments. But I, I had to outsource for the things that I knew were noise in my head. And I have, like, somebody who helps me with my social media now. 
Um, but I, I really, really encourage people to like set um, times of how much they'll be on social because it just is literally going to deteriorate your mental health. It's not worth it. Um, one of my friends, Jim Chetty, he said this to me and he was like, do you let a hundred people into your bedroom every single morning? That would be insane. Well, you wouldn't wake up and do that first thing. So why do we open up our phone and read hundreds of comments from random humans that we don't know? That That is so unhealthy to your brain. So um, same thing for when you go to bed at night. Like why, why are we going to bed with those thoughts of a hundred others rather than the thoughts of our own? So that's really like helped me kind of just again, you've got to find boundaries to all the noise. It's too much. Yeah, and the timing of it. I'd love to know what you do do, but what do you look at before you go to bed? Um, I'm not perfect again. Like it's really hard because again, I, I am an entrepreneur and I can't help but look at Slack or my emails, especially now that we're fundraising and there's so much going on with it, but I try. I do have a practice I put into place, but I, it doesn't always work. Um, I'm, I do, don't do shows now. I read a book, just the stillness of not having a device and looking at something that isn't like a virtual device has really helped because I used to fall asleep to TV. Um, more than anything, right? Like everybody says like, oh, I do journaling and I do all these like things, which I, I've tried all of those things. The best thing and the quickest thing, the most digestible thing I think everyone could do is one big inhale for four seconds, holding for four seconds in, and then exhaling for four seconds out. You can do it. I mean, they, the best is if you do it three times in a row, but even just that practice I really wish we went to school for breathing more. I, it, it is a complete game changer to my entire day. And I feel like it's so deprioritized and like around the world, honestly. Mainly, I feel like in America, I'm not gonna speak for the world, but um, <laughs> we're not just sitting there taking a second to take a breath. We're too busy just yeah. growing. Yeah. <sighs> uh, 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 no, I hear you. I think breath work and there's a lot the world can learn from also the one fourth of the population that you said exists. Um, so another question from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna maybe pronounce the name wrong. Chai Kyung Lily Kim. She asks, or he asks, um, what was the one moment that you felt stuck and how did you overcome in your journey? How did your community and support system help if they did? You know what's funny is I don't know what's wrong with me, but I don't know if I feel stuck. And again, it's not that I, do. I have really hard, crappy days that don't go as I want. But I think when they happen, it's almost like it's my responsibility as a leader of this company to not freak out and let it feel stuck, but more so again, like have my pity party. But I remember like when we were fundraising for the first time, the investor pulled out and changed their mind and that'll be in a book one day because that experience was really just showed me the true colors of the whole venture capital world. But anyways, that's another story. Um, but when that did happen, I remember when um, someone on my team told me, hey, this is what's going on. They were freaking out. I just was like, okay, that really sucks. We're, let's figure out a plan B. What are we going to do? What are our other options? Let's talk about the other options. Instead of just sitting there and being like, oh my God, freaking crying, honestly, because it's it, it it's a huge deal. It, it was, we needed that funding to keep the business alive. Um, but I just immediately went to plan B. How are we going to fix this? Like, we're not going to, we're not going to stop. We're not going to end this. Like there, there's, there's, always got to be a plan B. Like, are we going to go to more friends and family? Are we going to go to our existing investors? Was there another person that was interested? Let's go back to them. Let's exhaust all options before we like freak out. So um, I think it's just one of those things that I, I just don't let myself sit in it for too long and just recognize that like, it's not an option. You got to just keep going. Words of wisdom um, in a really hard environment. Um, I have a question from Kiara Choi and Jessica. I, um, I'm wondering if they're sitting together. <laughs> so can you share with us what the next big milestone for you and Live Tinted is towards driving diverse and inclusive beauty in the world um, and what the biggest challenge you're facing is? Um, will big brands start to include inclusivity both in marketing and in their products for people of color? I think the next big thing for me and 
big, big, big thing. There's so many exciting things. We're launching so many new products, cool partnerships, all the things is I have to see this brand go to India. Um, you know, our sales are absolutely predominantly in the U S but we live in a tinted globe. And that to me is very exciting to think how this brand can make a global impact. And I won't stop until we do. Um, granted it, it can't happen right away. I'm, I'm like planting the like bricks to build the house to get there because there's a lot of logistical and, and financial and a, a, a lot of reasons why. Um, but I feel like it has to happen for the reasons that you just said, like for the reasons of diversity and inclusion and the colorism problems that are happen exist globally, if not more in other countries. Um, so I feel like that has to happen and I'm going to make it happen. Um, will brands start doing the inclusivity? Yes, I absolutely, I think they already are. Like I said, I think some of it might be performative. Some of them are not doing it well. But I think that the pulse is there. And like I said, I have to have hope that it's going to just get better by each generation. I, um, I, you're so half glass full. I'm like this going into this weekend. I'm going to be so positive about everything after this chat. Um, a question from Mancha, and I think it's the last question um, before we close. Where did you find the pockets of support? Who were the first people or the first organizations to bet on you and take a chance and who believed in what you were trying to achieve? It's a great question. Um, I think pockets of support, definitely. I think the coolest part was I was terrified to tell my family that I was quitting my job. Um, I didn't want them to think they had to support me financially. I didn't want them to worry. Um, so I didn't tell them. But then my dad found out through the Indian grapevine and I went home and Long story short, he basically told me that he wanted to invest in me and, don't, and not because he's, I'm his daughter, but because he believes in me. And so I think that was the immediate support system that I was like, oh my God, like I don't need your money. All I needed to do was hear what you just said. And now I feel like I got this. I got my parents behind me. That's amazing. Like, so that gave me the immediate support. Um, so it was family um, definitely first, which I, I know I'm very fortunate to say and, and I know that not everybody can say that. And so I really do think these online ecosystems, you know, we're focusing on the negative side of things, but there are so many beautiful ways to be able to connect with people from all different parts of the world and life that have similar interests to you. So don't be afraid to go into those DMs. You know, a lot, a lot of people won't answer, but there's the one person that will. And, you know, for every 200 emails I sent out, one person replied and I got one job from that. So you just kind of have to keep persevering and keep going and finding those support systems in whatever way you can, because they really got me through some and still do get me through some dark times. And then also like my whole life, I feel like my career has been one big networking opportunity for me. I treated it that way too. And it really did play out that way because when I did then start my own brand, some of my earliest checks were angel checks from my former bosses and friends who believed in me, um, you know, the Bobby Browns of the world, one of the most iconic beauty brands ever, to my former boss at Birchbox, um, Haley Barna, she put in a personal check too. So um, you just never know when things come back around. So just treat your life as a networking opportunity, but be, be genuine about it because people can tell the difference. Wow. That I, you know, that is, it resonates. I tell my team that all the time, like, it's a journey, but I think we you lose relationships, but you don't have to, right? And I think keeping yeah. uh, your network is the most important thing that- Yeah, like Sasha, you're, you were officially in each other's network. You're not gonna get rid of me. I'm gonna be like, <laughs> you know. Oh, it goes both there. ways, it goes both ways. Okay, final question from me. Uh, you've um, inspired so many of us, um, especially me this morning or evening. Leave our audience with your closing statement. Um, you've said so many inspiring things. What's the one thing that you told us today or that you haven't told us that you want us to take away? One thing, man. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, I just think that so many people look for advice and I know that I am one of those people who's looking for advice and guidance from others. But I really hope that, this is gonna sound silly and funny, but I hope you don't take too much advice from others and 
build your own journey. Because I think that the reality is like, yes, like please like get inspired and take the nuggets of this that apply to you. But I think the problem with me is that when I first started, I read so many about other successful entrepreneurs' journeys. And then I had on my cap table as investors, some of the biggest entrepreneurs in the world who have built massive companies. And, and you know, I went to them for their advice and guidance and all the things. And it got to the point where it became noise in my head and I stopped trusting my own gut. And I stopped like thinking like, oh, well, I can't do this because they told me I, I'm, this isn't how you build a brand. And I can't do this because they didn't do it this way. And like, oh, no, no, no. I, didn't, I, I started to lose confidence in my own decision making because I was trying to follow the playbook of somebody else. So I guess my advice is to only take pieces of my advice and build your own playbook for your own life. Um, because, you know, if I listen to somebody else's advice, I wouldn't be paving the path for anyone else out there. So, you know, be the be the person that paves the path for somebody else and, and create your own journey that will hopefully inspire a whole generation of people. Wow, what a way to sum it up. Um, and I will say, Deepika, you do have billions of people around the world that are rooting for you. Um, Thank you. you. We tell the billions to buy the products because we, <laughs> you, know, you know how many investors tell me that the South Asian audience is not big enough? Every investor meeting I go to, because they're in the US, it's 5 million. And I'm like, let's talk about the global audience of people rooting for this brand. And so I need proof is in the numbers. So please, everyone Absolutely. go. <laughs> Live Tinted is available in all Ulta beauty stores in the US and livetinted.com ships worldwide. So you can go out and buy the products, support women of color, own businesses and, and support yourself um, and increase your confidence. I'm, I walk away today with a lot more confidence myself after listening to you, but also around that point around taking the nuggets that work but also building your own playbook um, really, really, really sticks with me. Um, so many people watching this today are remarkable. And Deepika, you're remarkable for giving us your time. I want to thank you for being a part of our third I Am Remarkable Week celebrations. Um, and I want to remind everyone to tune into our global awards ceremony, which is happening later today um, from the same links that, that you've received. Um, thank you once again, Deepika, um, for giving us your time on your evening. Thank you for having me. And you are also remarkable. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Bye, everyone.